Recently, I blogged about how to kind of use all the features of Tornado Effects when you write your applications. Uh, so, uh, uh, Carl Walker created an application. He's coming from a, a strong JavaFX background and he picked up Tornado FX very quickly. Uh, so, he wrote an application uh, with his kind of mindset. And then I tried to change that application to utilize as many Tornado FX features as possible. And we thought it worked out quite nicely, so we're going to try it again. So, this time, Carl made a customer app and it looks like this. Uh, you have a refresh button that will load a list of customers. You can select a customer and you have some input fields that will update so you can edit the selected customer. Also notice that whenever you hit refresh, you have this progress bar at the bottom and uh, the progress bar disappears whenever uh, there is no active uh, API call. So this is actually going out to a server, getting some JSON and uh, converting it into these objects. So you can see down here. So I have loaded the application in the background. I haven't looked very closely at it. And that was kind of the point of this to see kind of my, my reaction to the code and uh, what we can do to improve it. So we have a data class for the customer <clears throat> with an ID, first name and last name field. And we have a two string method that concatenates the first name and last, last name. Uh, of course, uh, in Kotlin, we don't need this. So it could be written even without the return like this doesn't help much, but I'm going to attack everything I see anyway. So we, the next thing we have is a customer model updated. That's an event, just kind of a signal event. It doesn't contain any data. We'll see where that is used. Then we have the main view of the application. So this contains a V box with a split pane and it loads two fragments inside that split pane and sets some padding. Then this H box will be for the the status bar in the bottom, I think. So let's fire this up again and, and uh, see how this uh, fits together. So this customer list fragment is probably here. Uh, and it seems it, it contains the button as well. And the details fragment will be this fragment over here. And the H box is this one, I think. <clears throat> okay, so before I look at the actual structure of the application, we'll look for syntax that we can uh, maybe improve upon. Uh, we can't, you know, instead of writing this plus find to add a fragment inside the split pane, we can just do add. It looks a bit cleaner. Uh, this padding, we now have a property for padding. You know, padding uh, uh, is uh, an insets object, but we have uh, shortcuts now. So we can say padding all is four. Uh, this one will accept any kind of number. So, uh, you know, you mostly write uh, uh, ints anyway. So why do you, why would you have to add this, uh, you know, uh, dot zero to make it into decimal? This looks a bit cleaner anyway. Now with the progress bar, uh, what he does is he, he uses the, the builder and then he accesses the progress property inside the builder and uh, and binds it to the task progress inside the customer view model. This can actually be done automatically in the constructor of the progress bar. So if we change this into this, it means exactly the same. Create a progress bar, bind the progress property to this task progress uh, property inside the view model. We can do the same with the label. Works exactly the same way. The visible property, it's not bad at all, but we just uh, included the visible when construct. So you can say visible when and then return a property, a Boolean property that will uh, make sure to update the visible state of the component. We actually also have a, a, a new one called um, removed when, which uh, will um, uh, which will actually remove the component, but that's not what we want here. Uh, it's not uh, released yet. That's why it didn't show up in my ID, but it, it will be soon. So we have the same thing for the padding here. Let's set it to four. The spacing can be configured in the builder. So we don't need that. Okay, so it's a bit more concise. The, the main giveaway or takeaway here was uh, uh, these two, the, the bindings I think helped a lot. Okay, so let's look at the customer list fragment. Uh, it contains a V box with a button on top and then the list view. Uh, what I don't like here is uh, uh, this 
listener on the selected item of the, uh, the list view. What it does is call update selected, which will call update selected uh, in the view model and pass in the new selection from the list view. This we can do a lot better. We'll have a look in a moment. Let's just make the other changes first. So this will be 10 and the spacing four we will add up here. So we'll revisit this in a second. Customer details. So this is the fragment on the right with the editor inside it. We have the same thing with the text fields. We can bind it in the same way. Uh, I think also I would probably make this into a form uh, with fields. It doesn't matter much. Uh, actually, it would be a bit more code. Uh, so we're not going to do it here. Uh, the functionality will be the same anyway. Padding all is 10. Now let's have a look at the customer view model. Uh, it actually injects another model inside it. We'll have a look at that in a second. Then it has a list of customers and then two properties for selected first name and selected last name. And these seem to be manually handled, yes, in the update selected uh, uh, call here. This one I don't like at all, and I think we should try to get rid of it. Um, all this code could be handled for us if uh, we had uh, an item view model, uh, which could uh, bind to the list view automatically. Uh, so we will first go and visit the customer object. I will make, I'll remove the data class annotation here and I will turn these into actually uh, actual uh, JavaFX properties. So this will be ID, first name, last name, um, like this. Now we will change this, this uh, customer view model so that uh, instead of it just having some fields, we will uh, make it into an item view model of type customer. So uh, this item inside this view model can now be bound to the list view. And uh, the selected first name and selected last name fields, we will bind to the item, the currently selected customer, that will be first name property. And we'll do the same for uh, the last name property. So that will be item last name property. Uh, if we go back to the list view now, we can remove this, this listener. Instead of all this, we can now say bind selected to the customer view model. This will do the same as this and this. This also goes away now. Um, <clears throat> let's see what else we can do. Here inside the view model, we subscribe to uh, the customer model updated um, event, but the event is actually fired inside the same component. I'm not quite sure why he would do this. And uh, I think since I don't understand it, we'll remove it. First, I'll go and delete this event. Let's go back down, remove the whole subscription, update from refresh. This could be called here instead. And let's look at the update from refresh. It's a single line. We might as well go back and uh, and do it on succeeded, I think. Now there might be a, a valid reason for doing that, but uh, I can't see it, so I'll remove it. Also, this update selected now goes away since uh, the binding is taken care of automatically for us. Okay, so we have a lot less code to, to deal with. And uh, the list view code looks a lot cleaner. We just bind the selected customer to this view model automatically. Um, let's see what else we have. We're doing some remoting calls. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I changed uh, the customer to be, um, uh, to have JavaFX properties. And I removed this constructor because I really don't like this at all. Uh, we're, we're downloading a list of customers in JSON format. And then for each JSON object, you see here, we add to this customer list um, and construct a customer object. We can do better if we introduce the JSON model into this. 
and we override the update model call, which will get JSON. And with this JSON, we can assign to our property. So we can say that uh, uh, ID is is uh, get int ID. Uh, first name is get string. First name and last name is get string last name. Now we have a way for this customer object to to uh, populate itself from JSON. If we look at the remoting call again now down here, we can remove almost all of this. Say list to model, and then say customer add all. We should be able to customers add all to remove all of this stuff, and we don't need to fire the event anymore. So the, the API call will now get the list of customers, turn it into a list of JSON objects, and then just call to model on it. And to model is smart enough to understand that uh, um, that we want a list of customers because the return type, or actually the type of the list, uh, is uh, of type customer. So it will utilize this update uh, model. Oh, sorry, update. Uh, yeah, update model uh, call we created to extract the JSON and put it into our properties. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, the reason he's creating this task object instead of just using run async is that right now, uh, run async uh, won't give you a way to access the update message and update progress uh, um, calls inside of the task. So this is something I would very much like to change, but right now this is the only way to do it. It's not much code anyway, so uh, I think it looks good enough. Let's uh, try to rerun our application and see if it's still working after all the changes. Yeah, seems to be doing the same thing still. So that was my uh, two cents on this application and the changes I, I feel are worth making to to make the, the whole thing easier to maintain. And uh, I also think this is the way to go to reduce the number of bugs in your applications. The less code you write, the less likely you are to make any mistakes. Thank you for watching.